Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. These are words that God spoke to Jacob in Genesis 28. Words that God was in in fact speaking again as he had previously spoken them to Jacob's father Isaac, to Jacob's grandfather Abraham. So here God is giving Jacob a threefold promise. The promise that God would give him the promised land as his inheritance. The promise that he would make Jacob into a mighty nation. And the promise that the Messiah, the very Savior of the world, would come from Jacob's own offspring and would, win, and would win eternal life for all who believe. So these are the words that God spoke to Jacob before the events of our Old Testament reading for today. And they are words that are certainly echoing in Jacob's memory during our Old Testament reading. Words that Jacob needs to hear God speak again. So the last time Jacob has seen his brother Esau... Esau is ready to kill him after Jacob and their mother deceived Isaac into giving Jacob, instead of Esau, his blessing. That blessing basically being the right to inherit this threefold promise from Isaac, who had received it from Abraham. So Jacob runs off to his uncle Laban for safety, where he eventually marries two wives, Leah and Rachel. But now in our Old Testament reading for today, Jacob has left his uncle Laban and taken Rachel and Leah and their children, his servants, and his livestock with him, and they're about to come into Esau's territory. So this is the first time in several years that Jacob is about to see his brother, and last he heard, his brother was fully intent on putting him to death. And so in this moment, Jacob is understandably quite terrified. Terrified that Esau and his men are about to attack his family and destroy them all, Terrified that he's never going to inherit this land that he was promised. Terrified that this mighty nation that he was supposed to become is never going to come to be. That they're going to be wiped out on the land in which they stand. And terrified that this promise that the Messiah is going to come from him. Terrified that this promise of the Savior of the world is all going to be lost in a pile of bloodshed and horror on account of Esau's wrath. And so, in this moment, Jacob is certainly remembering the words that God spoke to him. As his stomach is turning in knots, thinking about Esau destroying all of these promises that God gave him. Jacob is remembering this promise. As he's trembling at the thought of his stronger brother, slaughtering him and his family and taking all of this away from him. Jacob is remembering all of God's promises. Most in particular, that of the promised seed of Jacob, who is going to be the savior of the world. And so here in this moment, Jacob is filled with fear, he's filled with sorrow, he's filled with doubt. And so how does God respond? When Jacob is trying to cling to God's promise, while everything around him screams that God is not going to keep it, that God has forgotten him, what does God do? Well, God speaks that promise again. God again speaks this promise, where after Jacob refuses to give up wrestling, God blesses him. So even though our text says that, uh, that the one Jacob wrestles is a man, Jacob himself makes clear, theologically speaking, what's going on here. As verse 30 states, Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. This is a very important thing we see uh, through, all throughout the Old Testament, that the Bible teaches us quite clearly that anyone who sees God the Father cannot live, that you could not stand to be in the unhidden presence of the one who has created you. But very frequently throughout the scriptures, and in fact even throughout the Old Testament, it's God the Son that people come into contact with. This is how it is that, G- that Jacob was able to see God face to face and live. So this is in fact God the Son, the pre-incarnate Christ, who comes to earth to wrestle with Jacob. It is, in fact, the very promise himself who comes and allows Jacob to dig his hands into him to show him that God, in fact, is going to keep this promise. 
So in this moment, Jacob teaches us how it is that we as Christians should struggle with God, how we should wrestle with God when it seems like God isn't keeping his promises. When it looks like we, uh, Jacob won't inherit this land that God has promised him. J Jacob wraps his arms around the God who made that promise and won't let him and won't let it go won't let him go until he makes that promise again when it looks like Jacob's family isn't going to survive this wrath of of Esau as God swore that they're not going to thrive according to God's promise Jacob grapples until God swears once more and even when God touches his hip socket and puts it out of joint even when God brings Jacob more pain in order to test him Jacob refuses to give up he knows what God has promised him. He knows that everything around him is screaming that God is not going to keep this promise, and so he refuses to let go until God speaks that promise again. So when God says, let me, let me go for the day has broken, Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. In other words, Jacob says, I don't care how much you afflict me. It looks like your promise that the Messiah would come from my body is all but lost. So I'm not letting go until you reaffirm that promise, until you reaffirm the promise of making me into a mighty nation, until you reaffirm the promise that this is the land of my inheritance. I'm not letting go of you until you speak that promise again. And in that moment, that's exactly what the promise does. In that moment, the Messiah himself does exactly that, once again promising Jacob that the land he swore to give him would indeed be his. In that moment, the Son of God promised Jacob that no matter how mighty Esau was, no matter how great his rage, God was mightier and his, rage, and his love was greater. He had the power to put love into Esau's heart and he would ensure that Jacob, his brother, we would ensure Jacob that his brother wasn't going to destroy him or his family but embrace them. The offspring promised to Jacob who would not be born of a virgin for a few thousand years was here in this moment. And in this moment before Christ even took on human flesh, the Son of God stood before Jacob and promised the man who would be his many times over great-grandfather that he would indeed be born to him, that he would be among his people, that he would die for his sins, and that he would win the salvation promised to Jacob and everyone else who believed. In that moment, Christ spoke that promise again. And Jacob found peace. And God has spoken the same promise to you. When Christ went to the cross, the blood poured out of his veins and washed over your sins. At that cross, Jesus took the condemnation. You earned through your idolatry, your disobedience, your hatred and lust and covetousness, your lies and your pride. He took that condemnation and he claimed it as his own, ensuring that you would never face even a second of it in the life to come. From the cross, Jesus erased from existence everything that separated you from his Father in heaven. In his resurrection, Jesus gave you the right to enter into that Father's kingdom. And in your baptism, when you were clothed in the robe of his righteousness, Jesus placed you into that kingdom and made you a child of God, made you his brother and a co-heir of all of his Father's love and salvation, all of his kingdom. In his cross, in his resurrection, in your baptism, here in all of these moments, God promised you that his kingdom is your inheritance, a gift that no one will ever be able to take away from you. His, he promised you that his family is your family, the family that stretches from the north to the south, to the east to the west, a family that will thrive forever because it has been claimed in the blood of Christ. <coughs> He prom and in this moment, Jesus promised you that, his, uh, that he, in fact, being the only begotten Son of God, the Son of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the Son of Mary, that he will always be your Savior. So in the moments of your life, when it seems like God has forgotten his promises to you, in the moments when it seems like some form of Esau is going to bear down on you and tear you apart, well, in these moments... What do you do? Like Jacob, you wrestle with God. You dig your fingers into him. You hold on and you refuse to let go until he speaks those promises again. 
So when it seems like the land that God has promised you in this life is about to be lost, when you've lost your home, your job, when you're in danger of losing the things in this world that make your home seem like your home, don't give into your fear. When the people who have made your home what it is turn against you, when your friends leave you behind, when your children leave home and seem to forget all about you, in these moments, don't give in to the fear that Esau is going to take away the land and the blessing that God gave you. Instead, in these moments, wrap your arms around Christ and wrestle. Dig your fingers into your Bible. Open it up to the words of Matthew 6 where Jesus says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So grab a hold of these words and stick them right in the face of God and tell him that you won't let go until he blesses, until he, ble- until he speaks them again, until he blesses you. When your loved ones turn away from you, open your Bible to the words of Mark 10, where Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this life houses and brothers and sisters and mother and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Open up your Bible. Dig your fingers into those words and pound them into the flesh of Christ until he blesses you with them again. And if you don't find comfort in those words today, that doesn't mean that God has forgotten his promise. It simply means that the hour of your testing is not yet done. It means that your hip is not yet out of joint and that the day has not yet broken. So keep doing it. Keep holding on. Keep reading the words of the scriptures. Keep screaming for God to honor his promise. And one day, no matter how badly you limp, one day, in fact, you will find that he has. That he has not given up on you, that he has not forgotten you, but that all of his words and all of his promises still stand. Through the same words, God will speak to you, telling you that even if, you're, if you lose your house in this life, you will not lose your room in the mansion and the life to come. Through those same words that may not have comforted you the day before, God will again speak His promise telling you that even if everyone you know turns against you, no one can take away the family that you have gained when you were made into a child of His kingdom. Through these words, God will promise you that he will not let you starve, that out of the same love that gave you the bread of life, he he will give you your daily bread, that he will still provide for you and care for you in every day that you dwell in this temporal land that he gave you. Just as he will feed you forever with the forgiveness that Christ poured out for you upon the cross in the kingdom that will never be taken away, in the kingdom that forever remains, your promised land. As the world is growing increasingly hostile to the Christian faith, as Christians are brutally murdered throughout the world, as our nation forgets more and more the Lord who made us, and as our fear grows that the day is coming when Esau is going to rush into our churches and tear us to pieces, don't give in to your fear. As you look beside you on Sunday morning and you see that the people you have loved the most in this world are no longer here to share that word with you, no longer here to hold that hymnal with you and sing the gospel with you there in that moment, even when it looks like God has forgotten his promise. Don't give up, but dig your hands into Christ and wrestle. So there in those moments, come to church, sit in the pew, and when we sing the words, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. You sing those words right into the face of Christ until he once again proclaims to you his promise that he will, in fact, have mercy on you. Because he will. Through the word of forgiveness that I preach, there Christ will once again say to you 
that no one in this world can scatter your flock or take away your Christian family, that nothing and no power in this world can separate you from those who have been joined together with him in the waters of of your baptism. There Christ will say to you that even if the devil himself should come at you with bombs and bullets, he has no power because through his forgiveness, Christ has given you a victory that has never been taken away. And there through those same words, Christ promises you that those who no longer sit beside you on Sunday morning, those who have gone to be with him, are in fact still with you, that your Christian family remains, because Christ dwells with you, and wherever Christ is, there everyone who belongs to Christ remains with him. There Christ will say to you, through all of these words, that through his death he has given you a victory that can never be taken away. Through his resurrection, he has given you a family that can never be lost. So even if you face violence, even if you face death, you face nothing. Because Christ has already won everything for you. So this is the promise that Christ made to you in his death, his resurrection, and in his baptism. It is the promise that still stands today. And so if it still seems like he isn't keeping that promise, cling to those words, shove them in his face until he speaks the word of blessing. And if he has not spoken it yet, hang on, don't let go. And he will. And when your guilt is screaming in your ears, when you can't find, when you can't forget the sins that you've brought into this world, when you can still feel them in your fingers, in your mouth, and tearing at your heart, when, when you know that God has made this promise that your sins have been forgiven, and yet every single morning you wake up and you feel absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Christ has kept his word, when all you feel is the presence of your guilt, there in that moment, this doesn't mean that Christ has forgotten you. It just means that the day hasn't broken, and the hour of your wrestling isn't over. So, with your hip out of joint, Wounded as you are, come limping up to this altar and wrestle. So limp up to this altar singing the words, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Grant us thy peace. And press those words into Christ as you eat his body and drink his blood. And here at this altar, Christ will bless you. As he says to you, take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. There Jesus says to you, it doesn't matter what you feel. It matters what I say. And I say to you that your sins are no more. I say that I am still your Savior, still your Messiah, still the son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, still the son of Mary, still the son of God who came into this world to be your salvation and who is your salvation. I am still the one who has cast away your condemnation forever with my bloody cross and empty tomb. I am still the one who claimed you as my own in the waters of your baptism, who calls you my own brother. You have no more sins. You have no more guilt. You have no more reasons to be afraid. You have nothing but my love. Nothing but my forgiveness and life and salvation. You have nothing but my blessing. I've spoken it again. So you don't have to wrestle anymore. Amen.